Okay, coming back. We're still comparing Jude to Peter. It's real clear to me that Jude is playing on Peter rather than the other way around. Scholars have debated that too. And there's a sort of chronology that comes out of this. We have to go back first. James dies somewhere 62, 64. That's over here. James dies somewhere 62, 64. Then comes the um, invasion, siege of Jerusalem, which lasts for seven years off and on. And that's what Josephus writes about. And there's some debate as to whether or not the problem with James produced the kind of clashes that there were. If you look at Acts 22, you'll notice that Paul and James were trying to make nice with the Judaizers, with the Jews who didn't believe in Christ. So Paul went in for, this is in Acts 21, Paul went in for um, the Nazarite vow as a way of making nice with the, the Jews who didn't believe in Christ. That got him into a lot of trouble, and James was the guy who proposed Paul do it. So because it got Paul into a lot of trouble, he ended up getting arrested, and then of course James has left town out to dry, because James was the guy who proposed the thing in the first place. So the Jewish congregation that was anti-believing in Messiah would end up being at cross purposes with James, and they had to find a way to get him executed, which they finally did. Now whether or not that actually produced the uproar under Florus, which was around 66 AD, 64 AD, you know, take your pick, because we got a variance in the Roman BC AD. You know, that's up to, that's up to debate. The point is, James is dead, and that's why Jude is writing left-hand side. Okay? Is Jude writing just after James dies? That doesn't seem too likely. And the reason why is because obviously he was he was had written to whoever he's writing before. He's already in the diaspora, so it's post 64 for sure. Okay? Here on the flip side, we got Peter writing 2 Peter saying that he knows from God he's he's going to die. Between the two, we have the death of Paul. We know Paul was going to die because in 2 Timothy at the end, Paul said, you know, explains that he lost, that God told him he's going to die, and he wants Timothy with, it looks like, at least a six-month delay being allowed. He wants Timothy to bring the cloak, the parchments, and Mark. All right? So Paul's going to die. If Mark is in Babylon, the mark of the end of second end of first Peter, if Mark is in Babylon, that means Timothy went to Babylon, picked up Mark, went to Rome with the cloak and the parchments and Mark, and then stayed there. And then Hebrews 11, uh, 13, 23 tells us that Timothy got released, which means that Paul is dead when the book of Hebrews is written. So what I'm trying to do is establish Peter's dating relative to the book of Hebrews and relative to Jude. What seems to be, and I may have to change this later, what seems to be the proper chronology is first Paul dies, therefore book of Hebrews, therefore going to... No, no, first Paul dies. Therefore, you know, Peter knows about it. Therefore, Peter gets this notice from God, hi, you're going to die too is the ruler of the area controlled by Babylon, the, the ruler of the area that Babylon was in, was a, a fan of Nero. Okay, so then Peter would be next after Paul, and he knows that's going to happen to him, that's why he's writing 2 Peter, which he's saying right here in chapter 1, all right. And so he knows he's going to die, so he writes 2 Peter recommending Paul's letters. And then 2 Peter 2 is what Jude is talking back to. If you read, I'm not going to do that here. If you read 2 Peter 2, you'll see that Jude is basically drawing on it 
for his letter. Okay? So is Jude like the third guy? First Paul, for, well, fourth guy. First James dies, so therefore Jude takes over. Then Paul dies, so therefore Peter takes over, because Peter's writing to, to Paul's old stomping ground. We saw that in First Peter uh, 1. And then, since he knows he's going to die, right? Since he knows he's going to die, he writes Second Peter in maybe quick succession. And then fourth and finally, maybe Jude writes because Peter's dead. All right? So that would place this somewhere around 68 AD. All right? That's what I've been saying. Book of Hebrews might have come out after Peter, before or after Peter. Okay, probably after, but in the same year. Now, the reason why I say that is that there's very little reference in Peter to anything in the book of Hebrews. The only tie between them that I can see is the part about false teachers and the word milk. Milk is being used by the book of Hebrews in Hebrews uh, 5, 12, and 13. Okay, and Peter talks about, you know, desire the sincere milk of the word. Okay, in First Peter. So, it could be that the book of Hebrews is playing on Peter to elaborate on what Peter was talking about. You could argue instead that the book of Hebrews came out first, and when Peter says desire the sincere milk of the word, and then talks here about false teachers, because that's the theme of Second Peter. All right, Second Peter. Since that's his theme here, see, false. There will be. Okay, so he might be he might be commenting on and elaborating on the Book of Hebrews. Okay, because that's the basic warning in the Book of Hebrews, one of several. Okay, but down here. Okay. Here, see? Have. This is past tense. Look at the left hand side of the screen in Jude versus the right hand side of the screen in Peter. Okay? This is past tense. Have. Peter's saying will. Now he could be saying will, talking back to Matthew, th you know, 23 which he's definitely doing, but he keeps on using future tense. They will introduce, okay? Will follow, will exploit you. See the point? And then our boy, see? God didn't spare the angels. So now our boy is going to, to pattern after Second Peter 2, all right? But he's using current. Have secretly slipped among you. So now the question is, since Peter's coming out in about 68 AD, then when is Jude? Maybe it's a lot later than 68 AD. Because he's reminding. See, I want to remind you. Same theme as what Peter used. Okay, well, it's not much of a reminder if he's writing in the same year. So maybe this comes out like 10 years later, okay? That's, that's the, the window of timing for Jude that I think we're looking at here. It's somewhere like maybe 10 years later, okay? Now, the next, so he's validating Peter, okay? So now what we have to look at is if he's coming out 10 years later, is he also referencing the book of Hebrews in Mark's Gospel. Mark's Gospel very clearly is on the point about false teachers and about the apostasy of Christianity. Mark cherry picks the verses that he uses. He, he ties, he wraps himself around Mark, uh, Matthew and Luke's Gospel and he keeps on harping on immediately, next, 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 Uthus and Engus. I did that in my Mark series, okay, showing that. I haven't finished it yet, but I, I, I did it through uh, chapter 14, at least on those keywords, okay? 
So it's very clear that Mark comes out in the year of the four emperors. It's very clear that Peter comes out in the year of the four emperors. Okay? And that all this is a warning of what's going to happen as a result of the temple's, you know, imminent destruction. As a result of Paul's death. Okay, fine. Now he's saying, this guy here is saying that these guys, the false teachers have come just like Peter predicted. And therefore he's repeating what Peter said. Is he also referring back to Mark and the book of Hebrews? If he's referring to Mark, it must be very oblique. Because that's Mark's overall theme, is the, is the false teachers, the false doctrine, the, the not listening to Christ, the rejection, everything that Christ talked about in Matthew 23 coming true. That's the basic underpinning for the rhetorical style in Mark. So I can't really say that Jude is talking specifically back to Mark. He is obviously talking specifically back to Hebrews, I mean to Peter. Here he seems to be referencing Hebrews 3. Okay? Now, Peter was, had said the same thing right here. That's basically part, two different parts of 2 Peter. Okay, first and second Peter, and Sodom and Gomorrah. Okay, you can tell that. Just you'll have to read Second Peter to see the ties, because it's all over the place. Okay, and he's setting up an analogy between the religious false teachers and the homosexuals in Sodom and Gomorrah, because the Bible is always depicted apostasy. In you know Jewish apostasy is the same thing as being you know um, what do you want to call it uh, an adulterer or a homosexual. Okay, the Bible's always made that analogy between sexual perversion and being a false teacher. So that that is you know pulling it in. But where Jude differs is he brings this up. Okay. And there's been a lot of debate amongst the scholars, is Jude referring back to the non-canonical assumption of Moses? But that's not, this text doesn't, doesn't tie to the non-canonical, okay? Jude is asserting that this is actually what happened. So he's writing the same way that Moses did in the book of Genesis, just telling you something that he gets directly from God. This is an actual event that he's describing that, that an actual conversation between Michael and Satan. All right, so what he's doing is, see, that's in Second Peter. He's elaborating on Second Peter. Now what he's doing here is, see, he's, he's elaborating on the slander which right here is he's paralleling Peter right here okay he's elaborating on first he, he, he tags Peter with verse 8 and now in verse 9 he gives an elaboration on it that wasn't in any other book of the Bible <coughs> the point of doing that is to say, hi, I'm getting my info directly from God, so yes, this is a canonical book. Okay? And he's doing it to support what Peter said. And he's doing it to say, hi, I'm getting this from God, God is confirming what Peter said, and God is also confirming that this is a canonical book that I'm writing, Jude writing. Okay? But the, the doctrinal point he's making is that not even angels will dare do what the false teachers will dare do. Okay? See, because angels used to teach the Bible in the Old Testament directly to Israel. Alright? So, the false teachers are basically violating what the angels wouldn't do. And that's how bad they are. See? They speak against what they don't understand, then unreasoning animals. And that, too, is back here in Second Peter. Uh, right here. Okay. Same thing. Okay. So, 
he's basically saying that the false teachers are might as well be animals. That's how undiscerning they are. All right. So it's a doctrinal point that's the same as what Peter was saying, but he's adding information here that he has to have gotten directly from God. So whatever confirmation there might have been in the assumption of Moses, this, this thing is true. And if the assumption of Moses has something to say to it, well, maybe, maybe not, but it's not Bible. And you all you have to do is read it to know it's not Bible. In other words, a book that's not Bible can have some correct things in it. But that doesn't make it canon. Canon has to be perfect. Okay? And then, you know, he's still going on with... Um, the same themes that our boy Peter is doing here. Alright? Um... But he's using different, he's using extra analogies. So he's still rapping to Peter, but he's saying more about it. Okay? The way of Cain and using prophet. In other words, the false teachers are going after prophet. See, Cain, with, Cain means acquisitive, acquirer. It has a lot of other meanings. Okay, but they're going after prophet, these false teachers, just like Cain was. And Balaam, of course, was getting paid for his false prophecy. Okay, and Korah's rebellion was rebellion against Moses as a religious leader of Israel. Okay, um, my machine is starting to go bad. I'll have to pick this up at the next segment.